Hi, Paul here from Trek It, and we're up again at our usual woods uh, doing one of our product videos. This time it's more of a general video and we're going to talk about waterproof shell jackets. Now your shell jacket is your barrier layer for your three layer system. And if you want to know a little bit more detail about layering systems, Harry will put the link up on the video for the blog that contains an awful lot of information. So this video really is, is a kind of a general overview of waterproofs, how they're made, what to look out for, what kind of features you need, all that kind of thing. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about all the technical stuff. Again, that will be in a blog if you completely want to geek out on all the, all the data. To make a, a, a jacket waterproof, so I, I've got a waterproof jacket on today, it's just as well, it's raining. Uh, this is the Arcteryx Beta LT. Uh, and to make this jacket waterproof, uh, it's all down to the cleverness and the technology within the fabric. So the, uh, the, there's kind of two different ways to make a fabric waterproof. One is to laminate a membrane to it, and the other way is to coat a layer of PU on the back. Now generally the differences between the two uh, types of construction are that the membrane constructions are generally tougher, more durable, more breathable, more reliable, uh, better suited for more active, arduous use. Coated fabrics are, are less breathable, they're less expensive, and they're more suitable for sort of softer, casual, soft outdoor kind of use. Here at Trekit, we, uh, we would always recommend a three layer laminate construction for any serious mountain use. What is the laminate? So on the outside, you've got the face fabric, which is this red bit. And then on the inside, you've got the lining fabric, which is the gray bit. And then sandwiched between the two, will be your membrane. Now, I'm sure you all heard of Gore-Tex. Uh, there's Event, there's NeoShell, there's Pertex Shield, there's Dry Light. There's a whole myriad of different types of constructions of membrane, but they can be broken down into either microporous or hydrophilic. So microporous basically means micro tiny porous holes, full of holes, about nine billion per square inch in Gore-Tex. And those holes are bigger than water vapour, so that's the sort of warm, moist air that you're creating within the system. But they're smaller than water droplets, i.e. the rain. Hydrophilic membranes work in a slightly different way. They work along molecular chains. They absorb moisture into the membrane, pass it through the molecular chain, and it goes to the outside. So, you'll also have heard of different types of construction. at three layer, two layer, two and a half layer. Again, at Trekit, we recommend three layer where you've got the face fabric, the membrane, and the inner fabric all sandwiched together to create one bonded laminate construction. And those offer the best in terms of reliability and durability, and also offer the best value for money over the lifetime of the product, because they last longer, so therefore they're cheaper in the long run. So that's how you make a fabric waterproof, either laminated or coated, and, uh, but also breathability is a massive factor in waterproof jackets. It's all very easy to keep the water out, but you've also got to let that warm air escape from the system and so you're feeling more comfortable on the inside. Um, breathability is uh, massively affected by a whole load of different fabrics, but primarily by the DWR, or the durable water repellent, on the outside of the face fabric. So I don't know if you can see, Harry will do a little close up. This jacket is beading up. The water's hitting it, it's beading up and it's rolling off. So I'm shaking it and it's dry. Basically what that means is, it, is if the face fabric is dry, all the moisture on the inside can get out. Just imagine if you breathe on a cold pane of glass, it condenses on the inside. Your breath will condense on the inside. That's what will happen to your sweat and the moisture inside the jacket if it hits a layer of cold water on the outside. So as well as that DWR coating on the face fabric, the other thing that can massively affect the breathability of the jacket is the seam taping. Now, seam taping is essential to make it waterproof. When the, when the manufacturers, in this, case, in this case Arcteryx, when they make the jacket, they have to sew together all these panels and put the zips in and the pockets and things. And then the needles punch thousands of little holes in the fabric and those, those and where the seams are, they're not technically waterproof. So they tape the back of the seam. Now that taping fabric that they glue on, they heat seal it on, isn't breathable. So it's always worth having a look at your jacket to turn it inside out. It's, it's a thing that we do in the shop all the time to show customers that the jacket with the least amount of taping and the taping in the best placed areas is going to be the most breathable. So the more taping, the less breathable. Okay, so and the more seams, 
the less reliable that jacket could be in the long term. So you want to look for reduced seams and reduced taping. So like I said earlier, where there are no seams, it's much more breathable. Arcteryx have put absolutely no seams whatsoever through this entire panel of the jacket, which is running from your wrist down to your waist. So it's completely seam free, so you're getting the maximum breathability without having to insert a pit zip. Makes it lighter, more flexible and more comfortable to wear. So the face fabric, we talked a little bit about the face fabrics. These come in all sorts of different types and weights according to what your intended use is with the jacket. Uh, you'll find that most of the top end jackets will use a nylon face fabric simply because it's super tough and durable, it'll withstand wear and tear nicely and you can tell the durability of a fabric by its denier. So Arcteryx rather helpfully in all their product descriptions put a little D after a number. So this one's got I say 40 denier face fabric. So it'd be 40D. And that just describes the density and the weight of the fabric. So obviously the higher the number, the stronger and the more durable the fabric will be. The payoff is it'll be a little heavier and it'll be a little stiffer. So you've really got to think about what you're using the jacket for, whether you're going to be brushing up against rocks, you're going to use it for climbing and scrambling, or whether you're just going to use it for hill walking, in which case you can go for a softer, lighter fabric. Polyester is another very commonly used face fabric, and that material is generally used for people, like I just said, who want a, a slightly less arduous jacket, doing less sort of uh, abusive activities, and the polyesters tend to be softer, have a nicer drape and a softer feel, and will be quieter, uh, but obviously, not as robust. So choose your face fabric according to your activity. So when you're looking for a jacket, how are you going to know which one's the most breathable, which one's the most waterproof? There isn't really a, 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 a widely adopted standard to measure how waterproof something is or how breathable something is. There's lots and lots of different tests and different manufacturers will use different tests primarily to make their fabrics look better. However, the one that is most widely used uh, to test waterproofness is something called hydrostatic head. And a hydrostatic head basically means that they get a column, uh, a glass tube, uh, about an inch in diameter. They place some fabric at the bottom of it, they fill the tube with water, and when the fabric starts leaking, a measurement is taken, and that's uh, shown as millimetres and that describes how waterproof that fabric is. So the British standard for waterproof in the little kite mark you'll see is 1500 millimetres of hydrostatic head. So that means that the piece of fabric they're testing can withstand 1500 millimetres of water pressure before it leaks. Now to give you some idea of performance, this is a Gore Pro Shell jacket, or Gore Pro, sorry, Gore Pro Shell's a bit old school now, but it's just Gore Pro. And this has got a hydrostatic head around 38,000 millimetres, so hugely more. Breathability is also uh, a, a little vague. It's, uh, it's not covered by any particular standard, but the one you'll most likely see quoted is a test called MVTR, and that stands for Moisture Vapour Transmission Rate. So that's the amount of moisture vapour that a fabric, a square metre of fabric, can transmit through it over a 24-hour period. Here comes the rain. So that, that again is measured, uh, shown in grams per square metre. And something like this Gore-Tex jacket again has got an MVTR of around 35 to 38 grams of moisture per square metre per 24 hours. So right up there. I'm, I'm basically using this as an example because this uh, Arctex Beta LT really is kind of a, a good benchmark for top performance jackets. It's a great all-rounder. Uh, and those kind of figures, the hydrostatic head and the MVTR I've just quoted, are really uh, about as good as you can get. Now fit. It's pretty obvious, isn't it, really? You want your jacket to fit. But when we say fit, we really mean, what are you going to be wearing underneath? So we're out here today, it's raining, it's cold, it's about two or three degrees. Um, it's pretty miserable. So I've got on my Gore-Tex jacket. I've got on my uh, Hagloss Essence Mimic, I've got on my Rab Ventus, and I've got on my uh, Arcteryx Satoro base layer. So that's kind of my favourite layering system. And that's pretty much as, uh, as much as I would need for most activities. Uh, I'm warm enough when I'm stationary, 
and if I start to work hard, uh, I'm gonna strip layers off accordingly. So I got this jacket to make sure that I could fit my favorite layering system underneath. And as you can see, it's plenty long enough in the arms, it's plenty long enough in the body, there's movement in the shoulders. I'm uh, six foot three, I've got a 42 inch chest, 34 inch waist, this is a size large, and it's absolutely spot on. So even if I've just got a base there underneath, it doesn't feel too big and baggy. The other important thing to think about with fit is you don't want the jacket to be too baggy. The problem with a baggy jacket is it, it actually impairs the breathability and the performance of the fabric. Uh, most waterproof membrane or coated fabrics work by a temperature and humidity differential inside the jacket to outside. So if it's warmer and more humid inside than it is outside, it'll breathe superbly. Obviously, if it's really, really humid outside and a little bit humid inside, it won't breathe very well at all. So it's, it's understanding that principle. But if your jacket is really big and baggy and you've got a load of excess moving around inside, it'd be really hard to get that differential in humidity between the inside and the outside. And also it'll be uncomfortable if you've got to move, you don't want a baggy fabric flapping around if it's a windy day. So a, a, a neat trim fit that'll go over your layers that's comfortable to use is the perfect fit. Okay, so like I said, this is my jacket. It's a size large. I've got all my layers on. It fits me perfectly. But just to give you some idea of what a bad fitting jacket looks like, Harry's gonna come and put this on over a base layer. Harry's a lot slimmer than me. He's a bit more athletic and younger. So this is what it's gonna look like on Harry. Okay, so I talked earlier about choosing the right jacket to suit your activities. So that's what we're gonna cover in the function. Really, so are you, are you looking for a jacket that's going to be super lightweight, packed down small for high aerobic activities, it's going to spend most of the time in your pack? Are you looking for a jacket that's going to do, kind of do everything from dog walking to a bit of hill walking? Or are you looking for a jacket that is going to be super gnarly, tough, robust, you can go mountaineering, you can go to do some ski mountaineering, even some skiing in it, that's going to withstand years of abuse? And that's really going to be, that's going to dictate your choice around weight and pack size. Another important thing to consider when you're looking at the fit of the jacket is how easy it is to move in. Uh, I like to do a little bit of scrambling and some climbing in my jacket, so it's really important for me to have full articulation of the arms. So this one's got a pre-bent seam on the inside, an articulated elbow, so there's a bit more room in the fabric here to allow that elbow to bend without the cuff riding up. I can also reach up without the hem rising up too far and I've got plenty of room around the shoulders. So I popped the mountain equipment Janak on because this is a, a really versatile all-round mountain jacket, great value for money. It features their alpine fit, so it's a bit slimmer around the trunk and around the hips. So if you're wearing a harness or a rucksack hip belt, it doesn't all bunch up around the middle and be uncomfortable. Then it's cut larger around the shoulders and the arms to give you plenty of freedom of movement if you're climbing and scrambling. Articulated arms, pre-bent arms, it's just really comfortable to wear and feels nice and neat here. So if I'm gonna go on a, on a bit of a binge and eat a few pork pies, I'd soon fill this one out. But it's just something to bear in mind when you're looking at fit. So, obviously, with a rain jacket, you need a hood. Now, most of the time, if you're like me, you're going to be wearing a beanie, and you want your hood to be a nice, neat fit around your head, so that if you're looking around and looking up at climbs and things, you're not going to be uh, get your vision obscured. But there are going to be those times you want to wear a helmet, so you got to make sure that your hood can cope with both situations. So this is their Mountain HC hood, which means HC helmet compatible, but it's also pretty head compatible as well. So I'll pop this up and show you how it all works. So as you can see, with my beanie on, that's a nice, neat fit around my head. It's nice and comfortable, I can turn, and I don't get a face full of fabric. Does up, and gives me what I like to refer to as a full face closure. So ideally, uh, go for a jacket that gives you that function and that facility, because when you're out and about in the cold and the wind and the rain, what you want to be able to do is this. Hunker down. So that's full face closure. And you only get that with a fixed hood. Rollaway hoods don't give that uh, facility at all, just because of the way they're uh, 
engineered into the jacket. You'd also notice on this one it's got a wired peak and a stiffened visor and that's to stop the uh, visor from flopping it out around over your eyes or if you've got a helmet on just to form a protective peak over the top. So let's get my helmet and uh, I'll put that on and show you how it works with the helmet. Thanks Will. So with a helmet on, the HC hood on here will fit nicely and you can still hunker down and get that full face closure. Another feature that you'll see in a lot of jackets, which is uh, well replicated here on the Janak, are pit zips or underarm zips. And these are really useful for dumping heat if you're getting too hot but you don't want to unzip your jacket because it's pouring down with rain. So it's unlikely you're going to get moisture penetrating into the jacket from under your arms, but it just helps to dump heat without having to undo your jacket. So pockets, what are pockets for? They're for storing things, they're not for shoving your hands in and walking around. Uh, why would you walk around the mountains with your hands in your pockets? You're likely to trip up, you're going to be unbalanced and uh, it's just not cool. So pockets are for storage and these are A-line pockets. So they're in an A shape here and as you can see they're set a little bit higher in the jacket because this is designed for mountaineering and general mountain use. The assumption is you're going to have a rucksack belt or a harness on here. So if your pockets are set too low, you won't be able to use them. So these are big A-line pockets. Great big pockets, come all the way up here, go all the way down there, get a, a map in there. I usually keep uh, my beanie if I'm not using it or spare gloves, bits and pieces like that. But you don't want to overload it. That's what your rucksack's for. So, Pockets of storage. You'll notice the zips on the pockets nowadays are this kind of like laminated construction that's usually uh, a name that you're probably familiar with is YKK, uh, using things like Vislon and AquaGuard in the titles and that basically means that they're tough plastic zips that will run freely in the ice and snow and are much more water resistant. Now pockets technically aren't 100% waterproof just because of the way they're constructed even mountain equipment have put these little zip garages at the top here because when you pull a zip up there's normally a little gap left at the top so you can hide the puller away in this little garage and just keep that zip secured. So if you've got uh, things that you really want to keep dry my best advice is to put them in a waterproof pouch of some kind rather than trust the waterproofness of the pocket. You'll see some jackets are completely festooned with pockets. Again, a little unnecessary because, like I said earlier, the more seams and the more stitching a jacket has got, the more areas there are for potential failure through leakage or just through constructions falling apart. So you want to keep the seams to a minimum and that includes the pockets. And then finally, draw cords. They have the same function as, as, as adjustable cuffs. They're there to adjust the temperature and the breathability and the ventilation within the jacket. Mountain equipment, actually very cleverly, it's really worth pointing this out. They uh, use a, a dual tether system. So there's a separate draw cord running across the front and a separate one around the back. And the two ends are here. So it means you can tighten up the back and leave the front loose or vice versa. But it also means that if you're thrashing around with your ice axes or your walking poles, you're not likely to get the tip or the end of your ice axe caught in a loop, which is what you normally find. So lots, a lot safer for mountaineering. It's a really clever feature and that's unique to mountain equipment. So I just put on this Rab Arc jacket just to show you an example of a different type of fabric. So I'm gonna bang on about Gore-Tex all the time. This is made from Pertex Shield Plus. It's a, it's a hydrophilic membrane construction, so it's a three layer construction. But the big advantage you get with this type of fabric is that it's stretchy. So if you're reaching around, you're climbing, it's still got all that articulation, but it's got some fabric stretch in there as well. You only get that with those kind of hydrophilic membranes. So to summarize, choose the jacket that is fit for purpose for your intended use what are you going to be doing with the jacket how hard a life are you going to give the jacket make sure it fits you properly take into consideration the different layers you're going to wear underneath and choose a fabric that is uh, suitable for what you're doing in terms of breathability and waterproofing like i said there's an awful lot of technical information in the blogs harry will put the links up for those go and have a look 
And then lastly, choose one that you like. You know, if you, if you choose wisely and you choose a really good jacket that's fit for purpose, it's comfortable, is uh, gonna perform superbly, it's gonna do that for a very long time. It's gonna last you for years, so you gotta like it, okay? So, that's it, that's me, that's Paul done. I'm gonna go and find somewhere dry, go and have a cup of tea, I'm cold. So, uh, if you've got any comments or questions, add them to the bottom of the video. We always do love to hear from you guys. It's, uh, we do appreciate any feedback. And uh, until next time, see you guys again.